Hi. Today we're going to take a deep dive into Josquin's enigmatic satire, El Grillo. Why enigmatic? Well, both this piece and Josquin himself are a bit of a puzzle. Here's what we do know. First about El Grillo. It is a frottola. It's a kind of light-hearted Italian madrigal. I'm told they were very popular back in the day. As to what it's about, well, we don't really know. It seems to be an inane little ditty about why crickets are superior to songbirds. But, you know. One theory is that Josquin wrote it to tease a singer he knew, a chap by the name of Carlo Frillo. Another theory is that he intended it as a tongue-in-cheek complaint to his employers who'd forgotten to pay their singers. You know, as in, the cricket sings a long time, but only for love. Some other suggestions? I've read that it might be a parody of overly flowery humanist scholarship. I don't know. Or that there's a romantic subtext. Apparently there was a thing in 16th century Florence called the Festival of the Cricket, when young men gave crickets as gifts to the girls they wanted to date. I mean, how could you say no? Or, again, there might well be an erotic subtext. Apparently, grillo was slang for penis. Again, how could you say no? Anyway, one or more of the above may be true, or not. We just don't know. What do we know about Josquin the composer? Well, similarly, kind of little, which is weird because we know a lot about what his contemporaries thought of him. He was regarded as basically a musical genius. He was massively famous across Europe during his lifetime and afterwards, and his reputation was pretty monumental. He was a very versatile composer. He wrote in lots of different styles. And this actually causes problems today because it's kind of hard to tell which of the pieces we've got with his name on were actually by him and which were just attributed to him so people could sell more copies of their own music, which apparently was a thing. There's a famous quote from a grumpy 16th century editor along the lines that Josquin seems to compose more songs now that he's dead than he did while he was alive. We don't even really know what he looked like. The picture here is a recent painting based on a 17th century woodcut, but Josquin died in the 16th century, so who knows? how accurate even that is. One fun fact though, or supposedly a fact. He was a chorister in the Vatican for a while, and researchers think they might have found his name scratched into a hidden bit of wall in the Sistine Chapel. I don't know, I just think it would be so fun if literally the only thing we have written in Josquin's own hand is a bit of graffiti from his time as a Vatican choir boy. All right, let's talk about how to approach this piece in the first rehearsal. This won't take long because I only have one tip, really. So this song is episodic. Josquin has built it by joining together very short sections. I count five of them, plus one repeated. Depends a bit what you count as a section. Each part's on a different style. And often with a piece like this, you can teach it gradually tackling a different section in each rehearsal and then stitching it all together later. But that's not how I'd approach this piece. In fact, I do the opposite. I try and do it all in one pass, one rehearsal start to finish. And not only that, but I also try to tick multiple boxes as I went along. So words, notes and mood. Of course, I wouldn't expect it to be anywhere near perfect by the end of the first rehearsal and I wouldn't rehearse it at top speed. In fact, anyway, I take this piece a bit slower than many others. I'll explain that later. But still, I do think all the future work you do on the piece will be much easier if you get the basics of the whole thing under your belt in one go. And it's only 30-something bars, so it's very doable. A couple of reasons why I think this is a good idea. Firstly, well, it changes a lot, so singers aren't going to get bored. It's like rehearsing five different mini-pieces although admittedly all of them in Italian. Secondly, it's more fun for singers that way because they get a sense of the whole shape of the piece and how it progresses, and the sense of satisfaction they get when they feel like they've cracked the whole thing in one go is really worth something. 
Thirdly, I think the musical fun in this piece is as much in the contrast between sections as it is in the sections themselves. And if you rehearse them all very separately at first, you risk never quite capturing that. Anyway, I'll talk lots more about the idea of musical fun as we go on. Okay, note bashing. I think with an English-speaking choir, you'll probably have to pay more attention to the words, especially the fast bits, than the notes. But there are still a couple of small note-related traps for unsuspecting singers, although they're mostly easy to fix. At the start, some tenors may want to sing a B-flat in bar two because they feel like they're in F major. Well, they aren't. They'll make that mistake at most once, you'll fix it, and it will never happen again. At the same time, the first three or four notes are not totally intuitive for the altos either. They go below the tenors. That happens a lot in this piece, so they'll get used to it. If they do stumble with the low G, probably don't bother making them sing the passage on their own. It's more about hearing it in the chord, so doing it all together a few times will be enough. Next, just watch the notes and rhythms in this middle section. Man on fa com or blah blah blah. It might just need walking through a couple of times with the singers repeating the words after you in rhythm. Especially if your copies are notated a bit awkwardly like this one. The combination of the time change, the dotted ties and slurs, and the Italian elision of words, altri uccelli, can be a bit confusing when you first run into it. Here's how it sounds, admittedly, very fast. Yeah, I know that's also in the wrong key, but whatever. And finally, the glorious run for tenors in the last couple of bars of the piece needs a bit of care with those C naturals and B naturals and so on. This is the only potential problem that I suppose might persist past the first rehearsal, but hopefully with one or two good readers in the section it will easily be put to bed. Altos need to be smart in this last phrase too, and it's less fun for them, and they're once again below the tenors for part of it. Okay, on to the fun stuff. On the long word verso, altos and tenors are, well, not so much duetting as dueling. The two parts need to be equal and in real competition with each other. Now that means altos have to work harder, because it's low in the register for them and high for the tenors. And we all know who wins that fight. I would ask for heavy accents on the middle C's in both parts. That helps the altos cut through, and it also adds to the fun musical effect of competition because it sounds to the audience like the two parts disagree about where the first beat of the bar is. Then after the big pause, the next note on Dale is kind of exposed, especially if you perform it, as I think you should, nice and gently after that loud C major chord. It's not hard to pitch, of course, but it can be wobbly if it's not focused. By the way, I know this part of the video is called finesse, but there are places in this piece where I think too much finesse can spoil the performance. In fact, I'm going to confess something. I get kind of bored of hearing slick vocal ensembles perform pieces like this beautifully and sensitively, like it's a motet or something. I mean, yeah, they sing it fast, but they do it with such a straight face. I know this is what comes naturally to a lot of classical choirs, but I think there's a temptation with older music, especially choral music, to assume it should always be treated reverently, as if all classical music is supposed to be deadly serious. I find that attitude a bit weird when we know for a fact that the composer of a particular piece was not really being serious in the first place. I'm thinking of places like bar 30, where tenors leap suddenly up above the altos, and they're off the beat and they stay up there for ages. Now, it seems to me the only way to make sense of why Josquin writes this is because he wants it to sound like tenors sticking out in that very special way that only tenors know how. And the minute you point this out to your tenor section, and you point out that this time the composer is actually encouraging them, rather than the conductor asking them to can it, you just know they'll suddenly love this passage and they'll be grinning every time they sing it and the audience will enjoy it too. At least if your tenors are anything like mine. 
and I rather suspect they are. You might have picked up from my comments so far that I think this piece works best if it's basically played for laughs. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, I think it's a good piece, but it's absolutely meant to be parody. It's a string of naff musical jokes, and that's even before you get to any double entendres or smart-ass references to humanist scholarship or whatever it was. There's another famous quote about Josquin, supposedly said by Martin Luther, you know, the well-known comic, which is something like, other composers do what they can with the notes, but Josquin does what he likes. And in El Grillo, Josquin is very definitely doing what he likes. And this, by the way, is the reason I like to take this piece a bit slower than many other conductors do. I don't see it as a patter song where the aim is to impress the audience with how fast you can sing Italian. I like to allow just a bit more space to showcase some of the humour. Also, fast Italian is hard. And of course, it's up to you how much of this road you want to go down. There are many different ways to take this piece and you should absolutely follow your own instincts. But you're watching this video, so for the record, here's my quick cheat sheet for how I conduct this piece. First passage, bars one to 10, very bright, very smiley, a bit cheesy. As I mentioned earlier, I like to ham up the fight between the altos and tenors on long old verso. I often encourage the singers to visibly communicate with each other. And with the right choir, if they don't look too stilted, I might even ask for a bit of body language there. And since this is a joke about holding a note too long, of course I hold that last pause a bit longer than I should. Second passage, bars 11 to 16. Big contrast after that C major chord. This is light and dance-like and a bit flirtatious. The run of fast quavers on dale dale etc. I tend to make them heavy, but you could also make them very light or crescendo through them or whatever you like really, as long as they're fast. Then there's a repeat and you need to think about what to do. I tend to make the repeat quieter and then crescendo through at the end to launch into the fourth passage. That's bars 22 to 27. I make this bit nice and expressive, a bit of a break for the audience, but I've also heard it done very firmly. And finally, quando la maggiore is really a big contrast. I hear a lot of choirs rush through this, but I prefer to make it very declamatory, very passionate. It's about hot, sultry weather and singing for love. So I asked my singers to overdo it a bit, as if they were a bunch of soloists rather than an ensemble. Also, it's the only part that finishes in a minor key, so I get them to make it quite dark at the end, with really rich chest voices when it goes down low. By the end of it, I don't really care too much about choral tone and blend. And then I have to admit, I play the da capo for laughs too. After the very heavy and dramatic amore, with a big rowl and a big pause, I like to hit the reset button and play up that abrupt key change so it's back to happy and smiley opening. And that's it. Like I say, you don't have to do it my way by any means, but I would recommend playing for the laughs in this piece. And I find choirs enjoy working on a set of fun skills that they don't get to use too much when they're singing Bird and Elgar and so on. My aim is to have the choir and the audience smiling by the end of it, even if they have no more idea than the rest of us what it's really about. So much for Josquin. I hope this gave you at least some ideas to think about. My name is Toby Wardman and I'm a British choir conductor and my other videos are mostly about more serious music. You can find them on YouTube or you can find them in podcast format. I recently heard that podcast apps are called podcatchers. I like that. So why not find Deep Dive on your favourite podcatcher? Anyway, do subscribe either way so that you know when there's new stuff to watch or listen to. And in the meantime, keep singing for love. Bye for now.